Don't miss PETA's spectacular virtual event, our 40th anniversary and holiday party. Celebrate our bold work to save animals, sing along, dance along, dine along, and laugh along from home with over a thousand fellow PETA revelers, revolutionaries, and surprise guests. It's Saturday, December 12th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. You buy a ticket at PETA.org and get all the details there, and then you show up virtually. You won't want to miss this. It's the first ever live-streamed PETA party. Be part of it all as we celebrate global victories from our cutting-edge campaigns. There'll be celebrity award presentations, rollicking entertainment, humor, wonderful stories of animal rescues, a virtual gift and coupon suite, real gift boxes, and spectacular auction items to bid on. Plus, there'll be more sensational benefits for those choosing sponsorships. So join us, the PETA Spectacular Virtual Event, the 40th Anniversary and Holiday Party. It's Saturday, December 12th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Buy your tickets at PETA.org. Get your details there. PETA.org for the 40th anniversary and holiday party. PETA has released new footage of the horrible conditions at the Washington National Primate Research Center at the University of Washington. You know it's bad when one of the center's veteran scientists confirms it all. And now she works at PETA. That's next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind the scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Monkey Crossing, it's where scientist Dr. Lisa Jones Engel found herself when she realized the work she did at the Washington Primate Research Center was neither good ethics nor good science. She's becoming part of the trend of scientists who see the light and cross over to fight for the end of traditional animal research and advocate for the closure of the National Primate Center at the University of Washington, as well as the six other primate centers across the country. Here's my conversation with Dr. Lisa Jones Engel, now PETA's Senior Science Advisor for Primate Research, on the PETA Podcast. You worked at this Washington National Primate Research Center at the University of Washington in Seattle. What was it like to work there? I mean, at some point, I mean, how long were you there? I was at the Primate Center for 14 years as a scientist. Um, I went directly from my my PhD. I took a postdoc position at the, the Primate Center in the Department of Psychology. And I, I had every confidence when I went in, that I was going to be able to help them better understand, to better characterize the the primate biomedical model. And for 14 years, I hit my head against the wall. Yeah, 14 years. And and then I guess at one point, it was just one, one year too many, huh? It was... That's what I was thinking about this today. So I, I spent a total of 17 years at the at the UW, because when I left the primate center, I went up and to the faculty position in the anthropology department. But I was, because I I knew this question was going to come up and I think it was actually the Fulbright. Mm -hmm. And so this is a plug for anyone who's, who's looking at Fulbrights, but being able to step out to have five or six months where I could just kind of sit back, albeit in a foreign country, doing this research, but not being within the primate center itself, not being within that, that facility, it gave me a way, it gave me time to actually reflect and to realize, no, you don't belong here anymore. Your, your time here is done. It's time to move on. So it took time away. It took a time to go out and see what, 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 what did you see when you were, I presume you were observing primates, you were studying and observing primates? I was, I was actually, I was back in Bangladesh um, I'd spent a decade in Bangladesh as a research scientist. That was the work we were doing. We were looking at how diseases were moving between the monkeys and the, the folks in Bangladesh. I went back as a Fulbright scholar to focus on this very specific group of people called the Bede. These are the, the, the folks who, for 
millennia have used the dancing bears, the dancing monkeys, the, the snake charmers. Because um, I really, I had known from the research that they played a key role in helping us understand how monkeys and viruses are actually moving around that country. But I wanted to go back and I wanted to understand the people. I wanted to understand more about why these folks were not infected with some of the viruses we expected them to be, how they were getting their monkeys. But there was one day in particular, I was sitting um, with my translator and we had just, th these bede um, are, frankly, they are the, the lowest of the low when it comes to caste systems in, in South Asia. No one liked the bede. They were, they had no access to, to homes. They were, they were nomadic. Um, they had no access to health care. They were reviled by basically everyone. And they had monkeys. And they had used these monkeys for centuries to basically to, to, to live. I mean, that's how they, they went about begging and using these dancing monkeys. But one day I was sitting there and I was um, interviewing one of the people who had one of these monkeys. And I asked her such a, such a stupid question. I asked her like, do you love your monkey? I actually, so her monkey at that time was kind of sitting with me and I'm grooming that monkey and just kind of hanging out with this monkey, which is really what I love doing. So I said, hey, do you love your monkey? And I, had a, I spoke enough Bangla at that point where she replied, we, we eat from our monkeys. And I thought, wait a minute, I know you don't eat monkeys. I know you don't eat these monkeys. Did you just say we eat these monkeys? And so I had my, my interpreter clarify for me. And she's like, no, we eat from these monkeys. Everything that we have comes from these monkeys. Our ability to, to have rice in our bowl, our ability to, to move from place to place, our ability to, when we're lucky, send our children to school, put clothes on their back, comes from those monkeys. And that for me was just, it was another kind of, it was another one of those moments where I thought, you know, the, the relationship that we have with monkeys across all these different contexts are so profound. But here's a group who, frankly, their treatment of monkeys is, PETA has targeted the, the dancing monkeys in, in a number of countries. Um, but these folks had nothing. And they, they, they loved their monkeys in a way that just their monkeys were everything to them. And, so, and that was profound. And so this was like a an epiphany for you because yeah. you were also making a living off the monkeys. Exactly. And you know what? And you you just you you cut right to the chase on that one. I had been making my living on these monkeys, whether or not it was, you know, the the. Well, no, I'm just yeah. No, it's actually full stop. I've been making my living on these monkeys. Yep. Ouch. They got you, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, you got me on that one too, but well, yeah. Well, I mean, but when it happened and you were talking through the interpreter and you're there in Bangladesh, it must have struck you that you've been working maybe in the wrong place for all these years, huh? I had been using these monkeys. So when we started this research program 20 years ago, you know, we, we really talk about Team Monkey. Um, promoting human primate commensalism. So really promoting the way that humans and monkeys can get along. And this idea that by understanding this, we improve primate conservation. Um, that's, that's how I sell it. That's how I sold it. But sitting there that day, it all just kind of dropped into place to me, which was, yeah, I, I'd actually, I had, I had made my living off of monkeys. I wasn't a vivisector. I didn't cut monkeys open. I, but I did trap monkeys and I did sedate them. And then I collected measurements from them and I collected biological samples from them. I then woke them up. Now I'm also holding them on my lap and I've got this tremendous team experience around me and we're incredibly careful with these animals. And each time I would release them back into their where their home environment, where I got them from. So I felt very good about that, but I was eating from these monkeys. And, and so it must have struck you in this really odd way when you hear, when you're talking to these people and you were talking, you're describing the caste system and these people were 
unloved, lower than low, but you're with them. They're describing their love of the monkey. And it, and here you are from the first world, from privilege. It must have really hit you hard, huh? It hit me hard. And it just, you know, her look at me. It's like, what do you mean? What do we love these monkeys? It's It was this realization that, and the monkeys were so critical to their survival. They literally could not live without these animals. Some of these, these folks really did care very deeply for these, these monkeys. They, they had intimate relationships with them. It's, um, if you've never been groomed by a monkey, you're missing out. Let me tell you, there's this notion of, and this is actually why grooming is so important. It's when you have some other being that, that focuses so intently on you, it is, it's, it's, it's magical. It's, it's what we all really seek in our, our relationship with our partners is so, this absolute. Well, wait a minute. Groomed by a monkey. That means the, the monkeys actually lays hands on. And... Yeah, that's, 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 that's what monkeys do. And monkeys, whether it's, it's these performing monkeys, whether it's the, these monkeys that we see in the temples throughout South and Southeast Asia, the, the urban monkeys. You know, if monkeys get a chance, monkeys use grooming. They use touch to establish bonds, to, to develop their position in the hierarchy, to, to make relationships. That's the exact same thing that, that, that you and I do. You know, humans have gotten, we've kind of moved away from walking up to, to the next person or sitting down next to them and, and starting to kind of touch them and, 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 you know, flip through their hair. You know, monkeys aren't, they're not looking for, for lice or, or, dirt or whatnot. They're, and they do those things and they find some of those things, but what they're doing is they are establishing a relationship with that other, that other being that's powerful. That's, that brings them safety. It brings them affection. It brings them access to resources. It's what makes a monkey, a monkey being able to groom and to have contact with another monkey. So when you were with these monkeys and you got this revelation in this, this moment, what did you do when he got back home? I knew at that point that that my time doing this research was done. Um, you know, I, I certainly, I, I still went back to, I'm, I'm a scientist at my core, and there were still questions that I believed needed to be answered at that primate center. Like, hmm, why, why are we so terrified of tuberculosis and yet... We have all these monkeys who are exposed to people out in the wild with TB and they're not dropping dead, but we're afraid of it here in the lab. Why are we afraid of these other viruses that these monkeys exposed humans to out in, in the wild, but it doesn't seem to be transferring here. I still wanted to, to answer these basic scientific questions that I knew that I was uniquely positioned to answer because I had spent so many years straddling these two worlds, one foot with monkeys in the wild one foot in the, the primate biomedical facilities. But the Washington Primate Center didn't, didn't want to know the answer to those questions. And when I kept pushing, they said, you can leave now. And so I did. And I went up to the faculty, the UW faculty, and I taught undergraduates for a couple of years. I loved it. Um, and by some very, it had to be fate, there was the, the hand of God was in on this one yeah. um, because one day I got an email that said, Hey, do you want to join the university's animal oversight committee? And this is the committee that's responsible for, for looking at every experiment that uses animals actually passes through this committee. For the 14 years I was there, every time I was renewing my, my annual protocols, it would go to this institutional animal care and use committee. I believed in the, in the authority, in the validity, and the transparency of this committee. When I wrote my papers and submitted them, and I said in there, all of my protocols had been reviewed and approved by this ICOOK, the Institutional Animal Care Use Committee, I truly believed that I had cleared this, this ethical and the scientific bar because it had gone through this committee. And here it was 
the chair of this committee had reached out and said, hey, do you want to sit on this committee? And I said, yes. This was your way to make an impact, right? This was my way to make an impact. This was my way to put someone who, I, I know monkeys. I know what monkeys need physically, emotionally. I understand the, the basic science that's involved with monkeys. Um, I would have, I would be the type of, of member that actually the, the 1985 revision to the Animal Welfare Act to develop these I cook, I was, I was kind of what they were thinking about back then. It sounds like there's some kind of disappointment when you're on the Aya Cook I mean, from, because now you are behind the scenes and you can see what everyone else is doing. And what did you find? Were, were, was, were, were things to a level, an ethical level that was satisfactory to you? No, not at all. What became apparent very quickly was that, that the, this eye cook, in particular, the University of Washington eye cook, was functioning as, as a rubber stamp. Any protocol that came through, no matter how scientifically questionable, how physically disastrous it was to the animal, was approved. And that, to me, the... The, the iCooks were established to, to basically do these harm-benefit analysis. Come on, we're not stupid. Everyone knows that when you keep an animal in captivity in the lab, you are causing it harm. But the expectation had been for myself, and I think for many scientists, that the, that, that harm was being weighed against the benefits. And that was the job of the iCook to do. And at the University of Washington, that iCook was not doing that job. So no that, matter what, so that it was, went through. That was your Aya Cook, and then what? What happened to the? I mean, they got must have gotten to the point where you could not. You had to leave. At what point was? What, at what point did that happen? Ironically, it, it wasn't a monkey study. It was a a pig study, and it was a protocol that had actually been closed down or had not been active for three or four years. This was a surgical protocol. They wanted to train um, surgical residents and community surgeons using, using um, pigs. And when I read this protocol, I said, but wait a minute, what have you been doing for the last three years? And they said, oh, well, but now we have money. So now give us, give us live pigs. Let, let, let us do it with live pigs. And I was like, no, show me the data. Show me the data that would say that over these last three years, your cohort of surgeons were less well-trained using your alternatives than the previous cohorts who used live pigs. And I was literally shouted down in my eye cook. And I knew at that point that I was done. There was nothing more that I could do. And that was after nearly two full years. So, so I resigned. So you gave it a shot. You you gave it a shot first as an actual researcher, then as a member of the IACUC. So now maybe here you could do something about what you saw. And it sounds like you witnessed really a broken system, huh? I not just witnessed it. I, I documented it as well. And I, I found that the system wasn't just broken within the IACUC itself, but it was broken at every level. The desire to, to just to allow um, the system to continue to not, something as simple as I requested, we need to have an ethicist sitting on this IACUC. Our human subject review boards, they have ethicists who sit and review each one of these protocols that involves human subjects. We need to have an ethicist sitting on the IACUC. That's again, that's what the, the 85 amendment to the Animal Welfare Act was suggesting. You need to have these voices who can help us understand, who can make these incredibly difficult decisions, who can help weigh the harm to the animal versus the benefit. And you know what? Scientists and veterinarians, we're not trained to do that. Specialists, ethicists are trained to do that. They should be sitting on these types of committees. And yet it seemed like there was no interest in ethics and there was only interest in approving the, the research of 
the university? For their university self-interest, for the scientists and researchers' self-interest? I wouldn't say that there was an interest in improving the research at the university. The interest was to, to not derail this path that had been worn down and which everyone had followed until I showed up. I was a problem. I was the problem child. When that realization came, you must have seen the whole thing as a kind of a, a fraud in, in some ways. If it was intended to uh, make the system better by having an oversight committee, it, that must have been disappointing too. I, I was, I think I, I was destroyed. I, because I, I, as someone who believes so strongly in the power of science and who, who, believe, who knows that if you don't have good welfare, if you're going to do science, and this is what my very first mentor told me, and this is working in a chimpanzee lab. If you're going to do science, if you're going to, to expose these, to inflict this type of pain and harm on these animals, you have to maintain the highest standards of welfare. That's, that is the only justification. And at the University of Washington, it was, it was so transparently clear that the science suffered, the animals suffered horrifically, and the system was broken. And it was no longer using animals to, to do this research. No, it's wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And, and so what brought you to PETA and what made you think that maybe PETA would be the, the right way to go about overseeing all of this and maybe even trying to undo this mechanism that you were a part of all these years? I started with primates 30, what, 33 years ago. I started in the biomedical field 30 years ago. During that period, up until a year and a half ago, I never once went to the PETA website. The animal activist community was considered the, the enemy. They were considered um, silly nincompoops who, who just don't understand science. They don't under, they're just out there just kind of doing their, their crazy thing. Um, and I didn't actually go to PETA. PETA. PETA came to me. And in my first conversation on the phone with, with Alka and with Kathy, it became clear within about three minutes that these folks know what they're talking about. These women were able to, to put together, to, to synthesize, to connect the, the threads so quickly, so thoroughly. I was like, wait, this, that, somebody's been lying to me all these years. This is not what I expected. Well, of the activist community. Well, if someone was lying to you, I, I gather your, what, you, what you're saying is that the standard idea of all these activists and people who are counter to the research culture, they're just, they're, they're loonies. They're, they don't know what they're talking about. And, and that was maybe a form of propaganda in some ways. I, I, I absolutely agree. I, it's, you know, within within the primate biomedical community, it's you. The word comes down. These are the animal activists. They know nothing. You you don't you don't look at their materials. You certainly don't engage with them. We were always notified when the activists were were on campus or they were coming towards us. We were told, "This is how you behave." You you literally you do not engage. Um, so when I did engage, it was it was. It was revelatory. The, the type of understanding, the type of science that goes on at PETA, that's PETA scientists understand the science. They understand the welfare. They put the two together and they are an incredible force. And that is not something that I had anticipated at all. I had no idea what PETA was, what PETA was capable of. And you know, but it, it didn't take me very long to realize, oh, actually, you know what? This is this is where I was supposed to be. What prevents 
traditional mainstream science from from working together with those who want a more ethical science. Is there a way that they can work together? You know, I, I, what an interesting question. Is there a way you would think, I mean, I'm, my training is as an anthropologist. Um, So I'm actually trained to look at how connections are made between people. Um, And there is such an impenetrable wall that exists between the biomedical community and the activist community. So when I started with, with PETA, I thought that my job was going to be to basically, to once again, I was now going to be like, I have three legs. I'd have a leg in wild primates, a leg in science, and now I'd have a leg in, in animal activism. And uh, that leg was kicked out for me uh, about 36 hours after I joined PETA because I was scheduled to actually give a keynote address in D.C., a day and a half after I signed the PETA paperwork. Um, this was, this address had been um, scheduled many, many months in advance. The, it was a talk that I had given internationally. And it was basically me kind of going there and talking to these, these other scientists and these technicians and these husbandry folks this was all part of ALAP. And I was just gonna tell them about our very complex history that we've had with macaques. Um, I flew into DC. I actually got to the airport and I, when I let the folks know that, all right, I just want to be, and I was said, I want to be very transparent with you. I actually, I have a new job. I had already told them several months prior to that. I had left my university position. I told them why. And I said, I've got a new job. I'm now PETA's um, senior science advisor for primate experimentation. Um, and there was dead silence for a moment. And I said, you know what? I am who I am. I'm Lisa Jones Engel. I'm the same scientist that I've been f- forever. Here's here. Look at the presentations. Review them. There's nothing political about this. Um, they reviewed them. I went to bed. The next morning, I got a text at 7 a.m. Hey, can you come down see us in, in the, the the lobby of the of the hotel? I was then escorted off the premises. The the mere fact that I had, I now wore the, the, the PETA mantle was enough to completely, it, it, it terrified these folks. It, it, it separated me then from the scientific community that I had been a part of for 30 years. So you were a persona non grata, and the only thing that's keeping that kind of, uh, that kind of mindset is what self-preservation on the part of the scientists. What, what is it? An anti, it's an, almost an anti-science kind of approach. I, I think about this a lot. I do. I, I think about how, how can I, someone who I deeply love macaques, Emil, I, in, in a way that's just, you know, I've worked with chimps, I've worked with orangutans, but macaques are just, they're, they're my monkey, Right. And yet, for years and years, I would trap them, I would sedate them, I would do these things, I'd wake them up and I'd let them go. And I would do that confident in the knowledge that, you know, I was, I was collecting the, these very important data, that I was helping, helping kind of identify the next hot spot for the emerging disease, I was helping primate conservation. And even though I was, I saw time and again, examples of where I actually caused pain and suffering to these, these macaques, it didn't register in my brain. And I find that extraordinary that I couldn't see that. And I think that for scientists to, if you have to look into the eyes of those animals and, and to see what you're doing, you're, you're done for. You're, you're true. It's, it's, it is the ex- the extraordinary person who could continue on. So you have to keep yourself from looking them in the eye and seeing them for what they are for as long as you can, I guess, if you want to sustain your scientific practice, right? Exactly. One of my very first experiences at the, the Washington Primate Center 
was um, I needed to practice actually placing a, a tuberculin skin test in the eyelid of a monkey. So I contacted the husbandry staff, the vet staff, and said, I need to practice this. And they said, okay, come on downstairs. We've got a monkey who's actually going to um, to tissue, tissue redemption, tissue, tissue something. I was like, okay. I went downstairs um, and on the table was this obviously very deeply sedated macaque. It was a female nemestrina. She was beautiful. She was, um, she was on her back. Her arms and legs were tied out. She, was, um, she wasn't intubated. Tissue distribution, that's what she was scheduled for. As I'm standing there looking at her, um, and I've actually, I'm standing at the foot of the table and I'm, I'm touching her foot because again, I touch. I know this monkey couldn't feel me. And I knew at that point that she was gonna be, she was gonna be dead in a few minutes, but I wanted her to know that, that I was there. At that, right then, someone walked in um, and investigated. I don't think it was actually the principal investigator. I think it was probably a postdoc. He went up to the front of this monkey and within less than 30 seconds, he boop, plucked out her eye, dropped it into the, the dish and then left. And at no point in the time did that, that man touch that monkey. At no point did he acknowledge that that was a being right there who had just given herself. In her case, in his case, he took the eye. He didn't, he didn't see her. And I think that for most scientists, that's, they can't, they don't dare see. Because if they do, you can't, you can't continue to do what you do. And this is what PETA does. We, we make you see. Well, in defense of your colleague there, or former colleague, it makes for, does it make for a better science if you don't see it? Does, can, can they argue objectivity? Can they argue that, well, I have to keep arm's length so that I can get at the truth? Is that, does that stand up to that? that? that, that um, that's a, a well-trodden um, path that, that's repeated again and again. But the, the, what we know and what is so very clear is that everything that happens to these monkeys when they are in the primate facility impacts and distorts their utility, their, their use, their, when they are used as primate biomedical models. Everything from whether or not their mom was raised in a corral with other monkeys to the size of their cage, to the type of monkey chow that they get to eat, to the number of friends that they've had, their, to whether or not they've ever been able to spend time grooming another monkey. All of that impacts and distorts their the results of their, their physiology. And scientists don't know that. Not only do they not know that, they don't know enough to ask that. That, I think, is the problem. You now are firmly ensconced in PETA, and you are the senior science advisor. And now PETA has just released this video from inside your former workplace, the Washington National Primate Research Center at the University of Washington in Seattle. And it shows how these monkeys live. And, of course, this is the way they were living when you were there, I imagine, from your perspective now, how does it strike you how they're living? This is the same way they've been living for the last 60 years. That's, you know, the University of Washington will say, hey, we just built this fancy new multi-million dollar animal research care facility, the ARC. It's underground. The cages are the same. You know, maybe they're called Seattle style cages now or whatever style cages, but they're the same cage. They're the same dorm room fridge size cage that these monkeys have for decades and decades existed in. Nothing has changed. I, I don't know how to explain to you adequately or to the listener adequately how exquisitely social and intelligent macaques are except to give an example. Um, and actually, this was a thing that, that this 
This was the turning point in my research career. The Bede finished it off, but this monkey, also in Bangladesh, she, she started the very rapid slide. We were in a village doing the, the same type of research we've been doing for, for the last decade. Our trap was a, it's a large, it's like a, about a meter by a meter. No, two meters by two meters in size. It's, it's, it's very open. It's got this net that covers it. You know, you can certainly see what's going on and out. You can imagine um, that when we go into these villages to work, we, we often draw a big crowd, which was the case. So anyway, it had been a very good day. A lot of monkeys had come into the trap. We had closed the door. We had safely anesthetized them all. Um, we'd gotten an infant this time. And I was really, I generally was very careful not to get mom and infants because infants get upset. They squeak a lot. They, they, they make problems. This infant was a problem child. We're working on mom. This infant's climbing all around. You know, I've got people holding on to him. Anyway, we finish up. We put all the monkeys back in the, the big cage. The infant is back in there with mom. A couple of hours pass. The sun is setting. All the monkeys are woken up. I'm looking out. There's just pure grass in front of me. I'm like, this is going to be a great release. I got 50, 100 people standing behind me. I tilt the cage back. All the monkeys take off. I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had taken a picture. And then I hear squeak. And I look down and that, that infant was still holding on to the mesh. And in a nanosecond, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> whoops. Yeah. And I look out and mom is already 50, 75, 100 meters. I mean, she took off quickly. She heard that infant too. And she stopped and she literally did one of these things like checking her body, like, wait a minute, where's, and she turned around and again, she is facing 50, 75, 100 humans are right there. She did not hesitate for an instant. She came back. I'm still holding the trap back up. She comes in, she grabs that infant, sticks it on her and spins around and goes back. Um, and yeah, that's it. I was done. That, that, that she was going to do whatever she had to do to get that, that infant back no matter what it cost her. And just, I was like, no, I, I can't do this anymore. And it made me realize that it happened again and again. I just hadn't seen it. I hadn't, it hadn't wedged in my brain that these monkeys will do anything that they need to do in order to protect each other. And so now that you see this video that PETA has released showing the conditions, and now that you have a totally new set of lenses looking at this, what should the public be concerned about what's happening uh, at the, the Washington Primate Center? Primates are social creatures. In order to exist, in order to be, a primate has to be with other primates. So at the Washington Primate Center, at basically all of the primate centers, when these animals are kept in these conditions, these small cages, you are destroying everything that makes them a primate. You are, you're destroying their physiology. You're destroying their, their mental well-being. You're destroying their physical well-being. What does it do to the science if you put the monkeys in this situation where they're not even the, at the height of their monkeyness and they're something else? They're prisoners, really. What does it do to the science? Scientists cannot have it both ways. And actually, this is what the scientists want. They want to argue that macaques are, the, are a terrific biomedical model because they are so like us. You know, evolutionarily, we're similar. There's that whole 25 million year gap, but let's let that go for a side. Um, behaviorally, they're similar, similar. Immunologically, they're similar. But you know what? The biggest, they're, they're forgetting about those brains. You're right. Monkeys are just like us. And if you take us or you take a monkey and you stick us or the monkey in a small cage and you take away any type of physical comfort, any type of their ability to control their environment, any type of mental challenge, and, and you take away companionship, you destroy that being. You destroy the human. You destroy the monkey. 
and you you completely distort the science. We come on, we know what stress does to our bodies. We know now that the our gut microbiome has profound impact on 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 how we metabolize drugs. We know all of these things. And yet the scientists want us to think, well, you know what? Ah, you don't have to worry about that the monkeys is upset or that this is mentally um, truly torturous for these animals. Because we got their bodies, you know, just they're just they're just monkeys. What's the big deal? You know what? They are monkeys. That's the big deal. They are us. Macaques, only humans are more widely distributed primates around the world. And you know why macaques can do it? Because they are so like us. There's a reason why we call it torture. There's a reason that we use terms like isolation. Um, there are a reason why, you know, when, when I would hear these, these words coming out of the animal activist community, or even kind of early on with PETA, I, I, I really pushed back against those, those, those terms. Like, no, it, it, it's what we do is in torture. You know, it's not that they're in, in, in isolation. You know, they're singly caged. They're singly housed. But strip all that away. And what you see on those videos is that's, that is their life. That's their life from when they're born. The few that make it to old age, most actually don't. But they are spending decades in those cages, metal cage, they've got a, a little perch and they got a plastic Kong ball. And once a day, they might get a, a flavored ice cube or maybe they get some, some greens or someone will flip on the TV. We all know from our experience with this pandemic that that's, that is not, that's not life. We can't survive that. You know, you you also mentioned that all right, the mac macaques are, are are very similar to humans, and yet, as a basis for experimentation or as as models, they aren't really good substitutes for humans in order to get at the kind of scientific breakthroughs that people are are seeking in these primate centers, right? Absolutely not. It's early on. Someone was um, they were doing a study. So macaques are quadrupeds. They're arboreal. Actually, they're arboreal and, and terrestrial quadrupeds. They can move between the trees and the, the ground very, very easily. But they're quadrupeds. Yes, sometimes they, they sit upright. And yes, occasionally they will, will hang from, from an arm. But for most time, they, they walk on, on all fours. When they mate, they, they mate on all fours. And so someone was developing a... Um, they were... They were trying to develop um, an, an HIV treatment that would be used in human females. And I remember looking at this, it was long before I sat on the eye cook. And I was thinking, so you're, you're taking this, this kind of, it wasn't a spermicide, but they were taking this, this gel. They had the monkeys in the, the tabletop restraint device. They would stick in this gel and then they would, you know, wait and they would challenge them with, um, they would then um, challenge them with the virus. And again, this is all in the quadrupedal position. And my first thought was, um, I'm sorry, this is not how human females, this is not how we locomote. This is not how, how we mate. And it just, it was one of those things like, folks, monkeys are not furry little humans with tails. They're not. You, the, the things that matter are the same, like how how our brains respond to, to these types of deprivation and stress. But also many of the things that matter are simply not the same. And the scientists, you can't have it both ways on this. You, you know, you talk about uh, that. And then there are other things about the facilities like monkeys, scientists make errors and monkeys die. Uh, there's disease, there's, you know, problems with uh, oversight. And, uh, you know, th there are, are issues in these primate centers that aren't really adequately addressed. Uh, talk about some of them. So there are seven remaining primate centers. Uh, a few years ago, Harvard saw what was coming. They were, 
they saw the failings in their primate center. They saw the the welfare violations mounting up. They saw how expensive it was to keep monkeys. They saw how difficult it was to keep monkeys. And they closed their primate center down. And they've focused now on more human relevant research. The University of Washington Primate Center of the remaining seven is the, the poster child for everything that is wrong in a primate center. You have monkeys that strangle to death on enrichment devices. You have monkeys that repeatedly die of dehydration because the infrastructure is broken. The Utah Primate Center can't even do the most basic thing, which is to maintain the health and keep those monkeys infection free. They can't do that. And frankly, that is the raison d'etre of primate centers to begin with. They were established because scientists said, hey, we need a steady supply of, of clean monkeys. Well, that, that hasn't really worked out. That's another very long conversation. But the Udo Primate Center can't maintain their, they can't keep MRSA out of their colony. They can't keep valley fever out of their colony. They've had breaks with tuberculosis in their colony. They've had breaks with simian retroviruses in their colony. And if you're a monkey, from a scientist's perspective, a monkey is, is only good as a model as it is well characterized. The primate center can't do that. They can't even keep their, their own staff free of COVID-19 infections. And if you can't keep your staff healthy, you're not going to be able to keep your, your monkeys healthy. If you, and we don't know whether or not the, the primate center monkeys are, have been infected with COVID-19, but we know the staff members have been, and those staff worked intimately with the monkeys. If they can't keep their staff healthy, we, there's, there's no reason to expect that the integrity of the monkeys as research subjects have been maintained. Just from an infectious disease standpoint, to say nothing of the, again, the conditions that those monkeys are held at the Washington Primate Center are, they're medieval. So, so tell me, if we got rid of the primate centers, I mean, there are seven left. Harvard shut down a couple of years back. If everyone followed the, the example of Harvard, they shut down the primate centers. Would there be any loss in scientific progress or any kind of, um, you know, knowledge that would benefit mankind? Would we be at a loss at all if any of these primate centers or if all the primate centers were shut down? We wouldn't be at a loss at all. In fact, these primate centers were on their way to being shut down by NIH when the HIV AIDS pandemic hit 35 years ago. It was kind of like a boon for the primate centers at that point, because up to then they had not been fulfilling their promise. The pandemic hit, the scientists said, oh, we, we need something that, that looks like a human. Here, we got these monkeys, let us use these monkeys. And I ask you, 35 years on, do we have an HIV AIDS vaccine? No. no. Do we have a malaria vaccine? No. Do we have a tuberculosis vaccine? No. Do we have a Zika, a SARS, a MERS vaccine? No. We have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dead monkeys, billions of dollars wasted. These monkeys, these primate facilities are not the pathway to improve human health. And this COVID pandemic has shown it so clearly that the era of monkey research is done. It's over. We have vaccines in phase three clinical trials without lengthy monkey studies. And the only reason we use the monkey studies at all is what it's, it's a habit. The scientists who are doing this work now have realized that, no, there are better ways to do this science. There are quicker ways to do these science. And frankly, the monkey stuff only misleads us and sends us down the wrong path. The same way that the monkey studies have misled us and sent us down the wrong path for the last 60 years. Now, you mentioned AIDS and how the monkeys were on their way out. All right, that's 35 years, a generation in, in a few more years. Is this a generational thing where scientists who are just trying to hang on to their old methodologies? And if it is, what happens to the new scientists? I mean, where are they to come in and say, 
there are better models. There, there's a better way. You know, that's actually, that's, I think this is a generational issue and we are, we're seeing it. So the, the folks who are the scientists who are in the primate centers now, kind of the, the core scientists, they're all aging out. You know, they're, they're all retiring. They've, they've kind of, they've ridden that monkey throughout their, their career. And, you know, they're, they're kind of dusting their hands off and, and, and heading out. And we aren't seeing young scientists really who are coming in to pick this up because part of it is, is I think that there is this increased understanding of the ethical costs, the consequences ethically, morally of using primates in this type of truly horrific research. But even more importantly, the science, the science has not borne out. The, and so these young scientists are coming up and they're using these, these human relevant alternatives. And that's, that's a beautiful thing to see. It's, 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 they are not caught up in trying to, they don't have to sustain these primate centers. These, these primate centers are an enormous resource suck. NIH built them, they've established them, They've each year they've got to spend you know hundred million dollars plus just to keep the the lights on, to keep the monkeys fed, and it's it's hard to to stop this this basically this juggernaut that has just been been going forward. But I think it's very telling that you don't see young scientists choosing to to use monkeys in research. It's also almost like you're describing this, what I've always called a boondoggle, this idea that uh, scientists need a, like a welfare system to keep science, younger scientists, younger researchers employed. And there's a hierarchy and you go up the channel and you get more grants and you get more money. And then of course the university gets more money. And so it does, I mean, there's a scientific way to look at this and say, oh, no good. But then there's this boondoggle cash, federal grants, this way to to look at it. And once again, you come out and say, this is a bad model, too. It is a bad model. And it's a bad model because the the science hasn't played out and because it is extraordinarily expensive. You know, we, we stopped using chimpanzees about five years ago. Prior to that, we had, you know, the champ, chimps were really big in research at the start of the HIV AIDS epidemic, you know, but keeping chimps in, in captivity is astonishingly expensive. They, they're dangerous. They, um, they're big. And so when, as we started moving away from chimps, we went to macaques. Why? You know, macaques are a tenth of the size. They could stick a lot more in a much smaller place. It is, it is not surprising and it's not intentional that now what we're seeing in the primate community is, well, let's move away. So we left the chimps. You know, the macaques aren't quite, you know, doing what we thought they were going to do. Let's go to marmosets. Now, marmosets, a marmoset, a tiny new world monkey that the only salient factor is that they're little. They take up less space. They breed more rapidly than, than macaques. Chimps, you know, you know, you could get a, a chimp infant, you know, once every year and a half or so. You could get a, a rhesus infant, rhesus macaque infant every year or maybe a couple of year per year. Marmosets, they twin. They also reproduce much more quickly. More monkeys, more money, more messed up science. So, Lisa... You worked in wa- at the Washington National Primate Research Center, and now you're PETA's senior advisor, scientific advisor. PETA's released this video. What do you want people to take away from the videos, and what should they do to, to try to, to stop the, the National Primate Research Centers, like the one at UW? The University of Washington abuses and it kills monkeys. And we know that because once again, they, the Primate Center, as well as the university's Animal Experimentation Committee, are under investigation. 
by the USDA for these repeated violations of the Animal Welfare Act. This isn't the first time. This is UW and the Primate Center has a, a very long list of violations of the Animal Welfare Act. The, the error, the age of the primate as, as a research subject is done. This Washington National Primate Center is millions of dollars in debt. It has, it's going from leadership crisis to leadership crisis. It's hemorrhaging staff. They can't keep their monkeys healthy. They can't keep enough people present to take care of the animals. The scientists themselves are fleeing the center. It's time. And PETA is, we have been, we have been writing to the University of Washington, to the leadership, for a year now, actually, I started writing to the leadership long before I was, was PETA, saying, look, the, the information is there. The path forward is very clear. The path forward is to shut this primate center down, focus your resources on 21st century science. And this is what PETA is saying. You know, we've, we've got our, our web pages up. We've got our videos that are coming out. And we're asking the public to go to PETA.org. And to, to look at this information, to let the university leadership know that they've seen the, the information, they've seen the video, they've seen the documentation, they know that this primate center needs to close down. And now the university needs to make the decision. And the university is at an inflection point. January 26th is when the, the primate center would submit their next five-year renewal grant to the university or to the National Institutes of Health. The university can make the decision now to not submit that grant. And if they do that, that will allow for a very orderly, transparent, and effective way for this primate center to shut down, close down the science, to make arrangements for these monkeys to retire, to go into sanctuary. And for this, this chapter, this, this very embarrassing chapter for the University of Washington to be closed Dr. Lisa Jones Engel, now PETA's Senior Science Advisor for Primate Research. She used to work at the Washington Primate Research Center and advocates for its closing. For more information, go to PETA.org. And that's our show this time out. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on amok.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, that's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can always rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And don't forget our holiday spectacular, PETA's spectacular virtual event. It's our 40th anniversary and holiday parties celebrate the bold work to save animals you can sing along with about a thousand fellow revelers it's saturday december 12th 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific go to PETA.org for details buy a ticket and join in the fun that's december 12th saturday PETA's spectacular virtual event and thank you again for joining us Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. <laughs>